Controversy erupted over the last few weeks on something that's close to my heart as a practicing cardiologist, myocarditis. An incredibly rare disease state that most cardiologists will see a handful of times in their career suddenly has been all over the news. The most recent kerfuffle started where all kerfuffles start these days on Joe Rogan. Joe was interviewing an Australian media personality named Josh Zepp for some unknown reason, <laughs> and the subject of some of the COVID-19 vaccines causing myocarditis came up. Take a listen. Or there's an adverse risk associated with the vaccine. It's like yes. a two to four fold increase in the instances of myocarditis. Yes, but you know what? Hospitalization. The, you know that there's an increased risk of myocarditis in among that age cohort from getting COVID as well, which exceeds the risk of myocarditis from the vaccine. I don't think that's true. I don't think it it's is. true. I don't. No, no, no. I don't think it's true that there's an increased risk of myocarditis from people catching COVID that are young versus increased risk of myocarditis from the vaccine. No, there is. There's both. Pro well, let's look that up because I don't think that's true. <laughs> There's both. Myocarditis more common after COVID-19 infection than vaccination. But is this with children? Uh, yeah, we're talking about young people. Men and boys aged under 30 after this is what it says here. With, with children is the issue. Well, no, we were talking about 15-year-olds. Well, we're talking about young children. Male so, child. yes, 12 to 17. 12 to 17, more likely to develop myocarditis within three months of catching COVID at a rate of 450 cases per million infection. This compares to 67 cases of myocarditis per million at the same time following their second dose of Pfizer. Yeah, so you're about eight times likely to get myocarditis from getting COVID than from getting the vaccine. That's interesting. Now, that, that is said, not what I've read before, but also it's like... When, even when we're reading these things, it's like, what are we getting this from? Is this from well, the VAERS report? So this doesn't sound very good for Joe. He tried fact-checking something in real time and found the opposite of, a strongly held, of, of his strongly held belief. And it sounds uh, a little more legitimate, legitimate than your uncle's ranting on, on Facebook. Um, there was, of course, uh, an avalanche of reactions to this from all over the spectrum. Canadian academic David Gerlink chuckled at Joe Rogan having his, I'm quoting him, ass handed to him. Boy, Joe really does upset some people. Must be doing something right. <laughs> and there was, of course, pushback from the sources that Joe's comments came from. Because Joe's comments just didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, apparently, Josh Zepp's Twitter feed has been full of people pushing back, saying Joe was actually right. So Mr. Zepp, who understandably doesn't want to go read every myocarditis paper in the time of vaccines, tried to respond by going down the myocarditis rabbit hole, as he calls it. He smartly sought out the best informed cardiologist on the matter from the Cardiac Society of Australia. As he says by tweet, As non-experts, we should defer to expert consensus, not seek out dissidents who confirm our biases. That sounds well and good. Um, okay, but a quick aside here. What if you're the type of person that seeks to have their biases confirmed by authority? Well then, expert consensus did after all hold for some time that the Earth was the center of the solar system. A layperson at the time that listened to Galileo's argument and liked it more than the other one, where, uh, where in history should we put him relative to the mass of consensus worshippers? Anyway, the whole thing is a bit amusing because if Josh's views on microditis come from the consensus expert opinion, I, I disagree, um, isn't getting a consensus expert to confirm that opinion in some way confirming a bias? Actually, I take that back. It's worse. Media personality amplifies a view of some authority figure. When challenged, media personality brings representative of authority to confirm what he was amplifying. All seems a bit circular to me. But I'm actually far more curious to find out who the greatest cardiology mind in Australia is anyway. Cardiologists don't regularly meet in octagons in the UFC to figure this stuff out the way MMA fighters do. Dana White, if you're interested, let me know. I've been working out recently. Well, it turns out the greatest cardiology mind in Australia to answer this question is... A guy named Raj Puranik. Raj Puranik, consultant cardiologist and associate professor at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. At this point, I'm sure everyone is wondering if there's a global conspiracy by Indians to infiltrate all of cardiology globally. I mean, I don't know Australia at all, but I gotta say, I did not expect Aussie cardiologist Raj Puranik. I was more expecting this guy. Obviously, I spent my formative years in the 80s. But anyway, here's Dr. Peranik, love the Aussie accent, with his thoughts on how myocarditis, COVID, and the vaccines work. I think it's really important to set the scene here and talk about what um, myocarditis means in the context of COVID more broadly, because as you said, the research focuses very much on specific questions and answers to specific questions. COVID itself presents to your body a protein it's never seen before, which is the spike protein. And as part of your body's response to that spike protein, 
you will induce inflammation in your chest, which is why people have an upper respiratory tract infection, a lower respiratory tract infection. And sometimes that inflammatory process can spread across to the lining of the heart or even the heart muscle. So the vaccine itself, when people say it's vaccine related, what's happening is that the mRNA vaccine enters your body, it disappears in a, in a, in a couple of days or even within um, hours really, and it turns on your own body's machinery to produce this protein that is foreign to your body and then your body responds to it. So the really important issue here is that if you developed myocarditis after a vaccine, were you to have seen this protein from COVID itself, it could have killed you. It would have been, could have been lethal at the doses of virus and spike protein generated by the infection. Right. So, so Dr. Boronik believes that those who get myocarditis with vaccine were more than likely destined to get myocarditis with COVID. From what I can gather, his assumption is that the spike protein that's presented to the body by the vaccine gets into the heart muscle, and that may be the genesis of the problem. Since the amount of protein induced to be made by the body is much less than what may be presented to you with meeting SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID, out in the wild while deer hunting, lots of deer apparently have been found to have COVID, it's better to get the vaccine. This is really interesting because Dr. Peranik never tells Josh that this is actually just a theory and far from the consensus opinion. The consensus for certain authorities may be that the risk of myocarditis from COVID for all ages exceeds the risk from the vaccines. But what we're trying to gather here is how the, author- how the authorities came to that opinion. Dr. Puranik gives us one theory to support the consensus view. But to be clear, the mechanism outlined here, while plausible, is speculative and not supported by a number of different data sets. If this theory was true, it would, of course, be the case that whatever rate of myocarditis one sees with the vaccines, the rate of myocarditis seen with COVID would be multiples of that. Yet what's readily apparent is that there is a very different rate of myocarditis seen based on type of vaccine and based on age and sex. And certainly a number of data sets suggest that for young men, the risk of vaccine myocarditis is higher than the risk of COVID myocarditis. There's a slightly more in-depth dive on this coming a little later. Josh, to his credit, Josh uh, Zepp, uh, the uh, Australian media personality who was interviewing uh, Dr. Peranik, to his credit, pushes him on this and asks him why, uh, here I'm paraphrasing, if this is so obvious per your putative mechanism, some countries have recommended young men not get the Moderna vaccine. Like, why is that? Raj at first doesn't answer by talking about vaccines and the benefit of vaccines reducing risk of hospitalization and death in the general population, uh, which they do. And then, when he starts to talk about COVID risks to children, something really interesting happens. Take a listen. Now, if you take the issue of young people, and I think that's really important, the CDC reported, and Matthew Oster's group, and it's online, the CDC uh, vaccine adverse reaction uh, reporting system is online. They had um, their under 30 data presented in December. Now, remember, in the United States, and you were making a really good point here, 5 million children up to about December had had COVID and there were 500 deaths. This is not a benign condition. That's one in a thousand. Okay, so this is not a benign uh, condition. It it is true that children may do better with COVID, but that's still 500 deaths that didn't necessarily need to happen in unvaccinated people. Now, the issue about vaccination... Sorry, just to clarify, that's 1% of 1%, right? It's one ten ten thousandth, isn't it? 500 into 5 million... Cases. That's right. So one, one in a thousand. One in ten thousand. One in ten thousand, rather. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. I mean, it's a, and I would imagine there are more than five million cases of children in getting COVID. In, I mean, getting the infection, like in the United States, if there are three hundred thirty million people. But anyway, I, t- I, I take your point. It's not completely harmless, but yeah. but I also want to grant. I want to grant to the uh, you know to the sort of more vaccine hesitant people that uh, there sure. the the risk of uh, of mortality from catching COVID if you're you know under the age of twenty is uh, vanishingly low. So the cardiology expert brought on to talk about myocarditis is bringing up risks of COVID to kids and gets the rate of death off by a factor of 10 initially. He has to be corrected on this by media personality who has a talk radio show. He actually repeats multiple times that the risk of death from COVID to kids is 1 in 1,000, which isn't 500 divided by 5 million, as Josh actually says. That number actually is 1 in 10,000. But here, Josh again has to tell his audience that even this is an overestimate because there are likely way more than five children in the U.S. 
uh, sorry, 5 million children in the U.S. who had been infected with COVID by the time of the presentation Dr. Puranic is referencing. So as an FYI, in 2020, there are about 75, 75 million children in the U.S. under the age of 18. As of today, um, this is being recorded uh, sometime in late January in 2022, based on the CDC website, there have been 883 deaths of children who tested positive for COVID. If we conservatively assume that 60% of children less than 18 have been infected with COVID by now, um, you know, pa a pandemic that's been going on for two years with large multiple waves and multiple and all over the uh, country. That's 883 divided by 45 million, or two out of 100,000, approximately two out of 100,000, two per two per 100,000. And that's of course assuming every child who tragically died died from COVID. On top of that, we have to consider, as CDC Director Dr. Wolinski recently discovered as well, that many of the deaths from COVID are in very ill individuals. Um, so not quite applicable, maybe, you know, these rates aren't maybe applicable to the average healthy child. Um, I'm not looking to relitigate this because this gets very controversial to find an accurate point estimate. But simple point here that I don't think too many people are going to disagree with is that the estimate from the expert here, one in a thousand, is wildly off. And the irony here, given what happened on the Joe Rogan show, is that it takes Josh, the media personality radio host, fact-checking the doctor live on his show to leave li listeners with an actual accurate estimate of risk to children. As he says, as, as you know, Josh says on, on the show, it's the uh, death rate um, of this to anyone under age 20 is vanishingly rare. By the way, I still haven't heard a real answer to the question about why certain countries are restricting a type of mRNA vaccine to young males. He goes on, Raj Puranic goes on to say something about, Dr. Puranic goes on to say something about not being able to compare vaccines across delivery systems. I have no idea what that means. Um, as, we'll see soon, as we'll see soon, the vaccines have fairly different rates of myocarditis in the demographic where there's a concern, young men. Given all this, um, if you see different rates of some adverse outcome. In this case, we're talking about myocarditis, uh, inflammation of the um, uh, muscle of the heart. Um, uh, what's, you know, you can, there's, there's a plausible mechanism for why each of these different vaccines may give you different event rates when it comes to that. Um, and, 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 and the particular big break is that one is packaged as a lipid nanoparticle and the other is packaged as a viral vector vaccine. Um, there's research that hopefully is being done right now. Um, uh, there was a Wall Street Journal uh, article talking a little bit about uh, mechanisms and trying to understand mechanisms of myocarditis and why it's happening. Nobody quite understands why. These are all, you know, speculation in terms of saying, okay, these are how the vaccines differ, and maybe that's why there has something to do with why the mRNA vaccines have a higher rate of myocarditis than, say, the viral vector vaccine. Um, so I would ask Dr. Pranik again, why, pray tell, we can't compare these different vaccines against each other when we're measuring a common outcome? There are certainly mechanistic reasons not to consider these three vaccines to be the same. So, you know, removing the efficacy ar argument, which as I've alluded to with my, you know, back of the envelope calculations in terms of uh, how risky this is to, to, to children, um, you know, uh, when, you, when you take out that efficacy argument, because it seems hard to say it's a slam dunk in healthy children, um, if as a cardiologist, if you, you know, not, not even considering that argument, if as a cardiologist you were to simply speak to the cardiac safety of one type of vaccine over, the, over another, the answer here I think is pretty clear. Non-mRNA vaccines have much lower rates of myocarditis. Um, and it's the second dose of the mRNA vaccines given 20-some days after the first um, that appear to cause most of the trouble. So purely from a cardiac standpoint, the answer to Josh's question uh, Josh, Josh Zepp, Josh Zepp's question is reasonably clear. But unfortunately, I don't hear any of that from the cardiologist down under. Josh tries again to have expert consensus man answer the contrarians by bringing up a recent paper from Oxford published in Nature on rates of myocarditis after SARS-CoV-2 and a variety of vaccines, the, the three vaccines we've just talked about, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the two um, mRNA vaccines. Um, here's a clip of, of that. Yeah, it is low. It is low, but um, there is a way of preventing that uh, death, and that is through protection from vaccination. And if you look at the difference between the the different vaccines, there are it's very difficult to compare because the strategies of delivery, if you compare AstraZeneca versus the mRNA vaccine, are different, and the timing was very different. 
So, you know, you had the mRNA vaccines being delivered at a three-week interval, and you had the adenovector viral, the AZ-type vaccines being delivered at a three-month interval. And the dose between each of these vaccines, although they can't be directly compared, is also very, very different. So a 30-microgram Pfizer dose um, as opposed to a 100-microgram Moderna dose, so three times higher dosing. So when you're comparing all the different uh, vaccinations and you're looking at the side effect profile, you have to say that it's very difficult to compare apples with apples. But what was very reassuring from Matthew Oster's data was that with 86 million doses of mRNA vaccine being delivered in the United States, they came down to about 900 cases that met criteria um, in their reporting system for myocarditis, of which 90% of people had recovered. And there is definitely a preponderance of cases in the 16 to 18-year-olds after the second dose of that Pfizer um, vaccination or Moderna vaccination. And so just to clarify, a lot of people, as, as I mentioned, you know, anytime you have a high-profile dispute like, uh, like the one that I had over this particular point from a state of partial ignorance, yeah. uh, lots of people come out of the wo- woodwork with lots and lots of different reports and stories for, for you to read. And, uh, you know, so the, I've got a tsunami of of data that people would like me to pour over, one of which is an Oxford, uh, apparently the latest Oxford University research following the latest data. And uh, I have multiple people on uh, social media saying that the best research unequivocally shows that the rates of mRNA in vaccine-related myocarditis substantially exceed rates of COVID-related myocarditis in under 40 age groups. Is that just not true? No, we, we haven't observed that um, at all. And in fact, the most reliable data sets I think that you can really rely on, are, say, the Israeli data sets, we've got populations that are plugged into a health system. Like Even the VAR system in the United States is really um, a bit subjective in its reporting and uh, the criteria for making the diagnosis may not be as secure, whereas I think population data sets that we see from Israel, for example, would be a very reliable indicator of what's going on. And in there, as you pointed out, the rate of COVID causing myocarditis across the board is higher, albeit a lower uh, frequency in younger people. So just to rewind to how this all started, as a reminder, um, Joe, Josh Zepp, the Australian media personality, went on uh, Joe Rogan and challenged Joe Rogan when Joe Rogan said that in, in children, it, he thought that there were certain vaccines that caused myocarditis at higher rates than uh, COVID, um, than SARS-CoV-2, the virus that, have, that, that um, causes COVID. Um, a fact check live suggested um, something, brought up something that su- suggested that was not the case. Here now is the nature paper that Josh clearly has been sent multiple times after this controversy happened that speaks to this very question, right? So that, and this supports what Joe Rogan said. Um, here you have the uh, paper from uh, Nature, a figure from a uh, paper from Nature, and and here you see the Chad uh, Chad Ox one uh, vaccine all the way on the left, and you see no myocarditis in um, you know in, in kind of the, the the folks that we're interested in, which is people less than the age of forty. Um, you see no myocarditis um, in that group. In the BNT162B2, that's the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, we see some rates of myocarditis, second dose higher than first dose. And in the Moderna vaccine, remember the Moderna vaccine has the uh, has a three times the dose of the mRNA as the Pfizer vaccine, you see the highest rates of myocarditis. And you see myocarditis rates that are you know, very high in the first, or high, sorry, the high, high, higher than everything else in the first, uh, after the first dose, and highest after the second dose. And then, again, speaking to this idea of, well, what's the differential risk of SARS-CoV-2 myocarditis versus vaccine myocarditis, you see here, this column here, uh, folks that had a positive SARS-CoV-2 test, they had rates of myocarditis here that are less than the second dose of the Moderna vaccine. Um so, but, but, but here's the thing, this graph actually doesn't tell the whole story. It's really important to understand these points. There are three, there are three points. The number of people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 is very different than the number of people who test positive for SARS-CoV-2. 
It's actually the authors, <laughs> you know, the authors specifically labeled this column SARS-CoV-2 positive test. The reason they're labeling it as that is because that, that's their denominator. That's their denominator of how many people with myocarditis divided by people with a positive test. But as we know, um, you know, the people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and then have a positive test is smaller than the people that have that have had SARS-CoV-2. Not everyone, not everyone gets it. People with very mild disease, um, uh, people that don't know they have it, etc. You know, or people just don't go to get tested. Um, so this, you know, this reddish bar over here is actually going to be much is much smaller in reality because the denominator here is is wrong. Um, myocarditis after. Also, you know, in terms of this graph, uh, this is just everyone over the uh, less than the age of 40. So myocarditis after vaccine, we know, occurs at much higher rates, specifically in males. Women are far less affected. If you're being shown a myocarditis rate that isn't broken down by sex, it would be like somebody showing you a breast cancer rate that isn't stratified by sex. If the same person then recommends you as a male should get a yearly mammogram starting at age 40, please run away as fast as you can. From them, <laughs> the third issue is one that I haven't seen mentioned very frequently, um, and therefore maybe slightly controversial. But you know, against my, uh, uh, I'm I'm not from the Royal College of uh, of uh, of anywhere really. <laughs> I'm a cardiologist, so my suspicion as a clinical guy who sees a lot of patients is that the vast amount of myocarditis being picked up after after SARS-CoV-2 infection is restrict restricted to myocardial injury that happens in severely ill patients as opposed to the classic myocarditis which cardiologists typically have considered to be patients showing up with chest pain or heart failure who are then found to have a viral or immune mediated process affecting the heart obviously i think the best strategy is the one that avoids getting you critically ill um, and for the vast majority of adults the vaccines to SARS-CoV-2 have seemed to work well in reducing the risk of ending up critically ill um, but again, that's really not the point of contention. Um, comparing, you know, comparing the vaccine myocarditis, which generally afflicts young boys and men, involves, you know, these young, otherwise healthy folks presenting to the ER with severe chest pain and leaking cardiac enzymes. Comparing that group to the average patient critically ill in an intensive care unit is is really comparing apples to oranges. And no, this does not mean there are no perfectly healthy 25-year-olds that don't end up severely ill on ECMO. You know, basically some massive type of life support where you know you're taking over the function of the heart and lungs for the, the patient it's just that the average person critically ill in the icu leaking enzymes from their heart is 75 has had a prior heart attack kidney disease and diabetes um so these are you know sick people to begin with that leak some en leak enzymes when when they're critically ill from from anything um what isn't happening in any tsunami like fashion as is sometimes implied as is sometimes implied in the discussion is either the 40 year old man coming in with an acute COVID infection and chest pain, or even the 75 year old aforementioned with heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes, presenting with an acute SARS-CoV-2 infection that's primarily affecting the heart. That, that we're not seeing happening in any massive, massive rates. That happens, but it's incredibly rare. So not only is the denominator wrong in that nature paper, I'm pretty sure that the numerator is an overcount because myocarditis is being overdiagnosed. Um, it's not the traditional myocarditis that cardiologists, you know, see see rarely. Um, in a follow-up preprint, the authors do actually go back and do this race and age stratified, and you know, add race uh, to, uh, to to sorry, not race, add gender to the mix. So an age sex stratified analysis, and sure enough, even with the numerator and denominator for SARS-CoV-2 infection still screwed up, right? Um, myocarditis after the second dose of Moderna is multiple times the risk of myocarditis after a SARS-CoV-2 test. And actually, um, the again the risk of um, of uh, a myocarditis after a SARS-CoV-2 infection in men less than the age of 40 is is you know less than is probably less than you know uh, the, 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 a third dose of Pfizer, a second dose of Pfizer, um, and maybe even a second dose of um, of the um, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. So. You know, we have to be careful because of error bars here and uh, what. But but there's there's no question that, you know, <laughs> error bars are not. You know, second dose of Moderna seems to be um, much, much, much higher risk for myocarditis than after getting a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Remember, this red bar would be much smaller because that denominator needs to be bigger and that numerator is probably uh, uh, not reflective of SARS-CoV-2 primarily in infecting 
um, the hard. That's my that's my bet. Um, I'll also point out, so therefore, um, you know, and this has been known for some time. This is not something that just came up now in 2022. Um, you know, this is from October of 2021, um, a headline that shows that um, Finland joins Sweden and Denmark in limiting Moderna COVID-19 vaccine to young men. Um, so, you know, I, 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 uh, vaccinate everyone's strategy, which is, which is controversial for it, its, own, its own reasons, at the very least should involve recommending a non-mRNA vaccine in young men or maybe exploring in a study if myocarditis rates are lower with a delayed second dose or maybe even study the effectiveness of a one-dose mRNA strategy in healthy young boys and men. This, by the way, this exact thing, meaning we should explore different approaches to vaccination, this exact concept um, is mentioned by the authors of this nature paper. Um, so again, I think the risk benefit of vaccines in young people is, 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 a, is, is a challenging discussion that brings to bear other many other issues than what we're talking about here. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's as easy as I think some um, uh, would, would like it to be if you take away this idea that, oh my goodness, SARS-CoV-2 causes myocarditis at multiple times the rate of the vaccine. It, that does not appear to be what the totality of evidence is really, is, is certainly is showing. So, you know, to his credit, Dr. Peranik does go beyond what, does go beyond what he's observed um, in Australia to rebut the nature study um, by noting that he thinks Israel has better data than the UK. I'm not entirely sure why that is, because the UK has a socialized government control system on a small island, which means that they don't have hundreds of different electronic medical records like we have in the U.S. to lose people in. There are all sorts of problems I have with the U.K.'s medical system, uh, but not having a good centralized record-keeping system isn't one of them. Um, but there's a problem <laughs> with what Dr. Peranik is saying uh, with regards to the Israeli data. Um, I assume Dr. Peranik is referring to Israeli data from September 2020 by BARDA et al. Um, this was a study that looked at myocarditis rates 42 days after the first dose of vaccine and compared it to myocarditis rates in a matched group of uh, unvaccinated persons. So they had to go match. Uh, anyway, they, they required some statistical um, statistical statistical approach to get uh, to, to figure out what the rate of myocarditis was between vaccinated and unvaccinated. All right, um, but but beyond beyond the fact that it wasn't just a straight comparison of unvaccinated and vaccinated and that, you know, it's the study's major issue is that there's no age and sex stratified analysis provided. Like I already told you, the whole point of contention is, should we be doing this in young men? You know, and that's what, that, that, that's where, some, you know, a lot of this started in. Uh, that, that's where this, you know, initial whole uh, debate started. Um, so the contentious issue we're most, interest, we're most interested in and why Dr. Pranik is on the show does you know, um, this paper that he's bringing up to, to you know, buttress his argument, it does not relate to risks and benefits of vaccine um, in young men. Um, so, you know, this paper that Peranik is referencing doesn't give us the information that we want, which is, okay, what's the, oh, in the Israeli population, because I guess they're better record keepers in the UK, um, uh, what is the, you know, are we seeing the same pattern in Israel? Uh, you know, uh, versus the UK. And it would be a big deal if we didn't see it in Israel, but we did see it in the UK because, okay, that raises a significant problem. Maybe there's something weird going on in the UK. <laughs> um, but, you know, we know, anyone who's following this knows that the original reports of myocarditis, the reason we're even doing this, the reason the, uh, the UK did this study, you know, uh, a few months ago, was because this was first noticed, the myocarditis uh, rates in young men was first noticed in Israel by researchers um, at Hadassah, at Hadassah, one of their uh, medical universities, by Dr. Dror Mevorak. Um, so he examined myocarditis rates by age and sex after the Pfizer vaccine, right? I mean, this was not done by his by his call by his other Israeli colleagues, you know, Dr. Barda and company, um, Dr. Mevarak and colleagues, when they looked at this by um, age and sex, voila, the rate of myocarditis in vaccinated young males is eight times that of unvaccinated young males. Um, so this is again an Israeli data set, you know, the the better than the UK, according to Dr. Um, Dr. Peranik. Um, and I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll read, I'll, you know, if you don't believe me, I'll read the exact uh, sentence from his paper, from Dr. Mevarak's paper. Uh, the rate ratio 30 days after the second vaccine dose in fully vaccinated recipients as compared with unvaccinated person was 2.35. So, so, every, so for everyone, two times, all right, 2x. 
um, in terms of myocarditis. The rate ratio was highest in male recipients between the ages of 16 and 19 years, 8.9 times. Um, higher. Again, there's error bars, confidence intervals around that, but but eight times is not 1.2 times. All right, yeah, 8.9 times is not 1.2 times. Um, so, and, and there's more than just Israeli data. We have more. We, we have more data sets that we could go over that haven't been mentioned. Um, there's a particularly interesting paper published in JAMA that, unlike many of the papers in this space, requires not just a diagnostic code entered into a computer system. All right, a lot of these papers are, are electronic medical record searches on, on the code, on the ICD-10 code, or the diagnostic code of myocarditis. And, you know, some, and, and that, you know, <laughs> this can this can be entered into an electronic medical record by a sleep-deprived trainee, and that's it. This patient now has myocarditis, and when you do a search on myocarditis, you know, six months later, it'll pop up whether or not, you know, so whether or not the patient really had myocarditis or not. You need more than that generally to, to, to say that somebody had myocarditis. So in this JAMA paper that I really liked, partly because it required supporting imaging data, cardiac imaging data, and supportive laboratory data, right? Not just the code myocarditis, you see something very interesting happen. There's no spike in this in this study from JAMA. There's no spike in myocarditis rates until um, you know around March, you know February March of uh, 2021, which is after the which is you know um, about whatever uh, which is after the vaccine rollout. The rates of myocarditis in all of 2020, when there were massive raging pandemics going through going uh, you know uh, happening in the United States, uh, there is no spike in rates of myocarditis seen. Which, by the way, fits with what practicing cardiologists will tell you in the United States. Like, we're not seeing, we're not deluged in clinics, outpatient clinics, by patients showing up after COVID with myocarditis. And, and which is, again, why I think that a lot of these myocarditis, myocarditis diagnoses are related to inflammation, injury of the heart muscle in critically ill patients in, in ICUs. Um, there are, of course, a number of papers that we can go over. Um, but, you know, but I thought I'd bring up one other paper. Since Dr. Pranik throws some shade at the VAERS reporting system in the U.S., that's the Voluntary Ac uh, Vaccine Adverse Reporting System um, that we have in the U.S. to kind of look for a signal of harm after vaccines. There was another recent study published by the journal, uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, that was based on a CDC review of the VAERS database. So you can't just use VAERS. You have to actually go in, look at each case in VAERS, and try to then examine the clinical data to see, okay, does this make sense or not? So, so you know, we, uh, folks from the CDC uh, did this just recently, um, you know, I think about two, three weeks ago, and they also confirmed rates of myocarditis exceed the expected rates across multiple agent sex strata with the highest risk after the second vaccination dose in adolescent males, age 12 to 15, adoles adolescent males 16 to 17, and, and uh, young men aged 18 to 24 years uh, old. Importantly, especially since Dr. Peranik and others have doubts about the veracity of the VARS data, the study authors noted, this is in quotes, given the high verification rate of reports of myocarditis to VARS after mRNA-based vaccination, underreporting is likely. Therefore, the actual rates of myocarditis per million dose of vaccine are likely higher than estimated. So it takes a really simplistic, narrow view of this specific topic, myocarditis, vaccines, and COVID, to firmly say vaccine myocarditis rates are lower than COVID myocarditis rates across all ages and demographics. Again, the matter of whether to vaccinate everyone knowing what we know is a separate issue. And it's kind of telling that every every time Josh Zepps, the Australian radio host, tries to really ask specific questions about myocarditis rates, Dr. Peronic essentially dodges the question and try to place the question in a broader context of benefits to society that accrue from safeguarding grandparents and reducing the number of variants through, uni through um, universal vaccination. These are both complicated questions that each require their own three-hour podcast and actually can't be answered. I, I, I don't think can be answered completely by science, even if science had a simple answer. Um, given the reports of animal reservoirs, do I need to vaccinate my Shiba Inu and arm the children with mRNA vaccine tranquilizer guns for the deer in the backyard for the greater good? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, this is all well outside. My point is this is well, all well outside the scope of a discussion that started with a simple fact check of myocarditis rates. Um, so, you know, here's hoping media personalities like Josh Shep worship the consensus, consensus opinion a little less. Uh, contrarians do have an agenda, no question, uh, but it would be a way bigger mistake, I think, to simply assume the authorities and institutions don't have their own agenda. Having an agenda isn't disqualifying. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, um, the authorities had an agenda when they rolled out the polio vaccination campaign in the 50s and 60s. Um, so, you know, just having an agenda is not, is not a bad thing. 
Um, but just simply accepting one view as impartial truth and manufacturing consensus to support political goals really doesn't do anyone any favors. So thanks so much. I hope you got some value out of that. Um, the myocarditis rabbit hole is a very, very deep one, one that uh, Josh Zepps may uh, not quite get how incredibly deep that is. There's a lot more to say on the topic. There's a lot more studies to go over. Maybe I'll make another video for that down the road. Uh, but for now, I think that was... Um, uh, you know, my, my attempt to just uh, uh, go over how complex of a topic uh, it, it is. Um, I, uh, on a plus note, I hope you'll uh, listen to uh, some of the fantastic guests that we have coming up on the Akkad and Kogel Report. Thanks so much. See you. Bye-bye.